Great. Thanks, everyone. Meeting's about to start. If I could ask you all to take your seats. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. This is the uh, monthly meeting of Froome Town Council. Um, we have uh, a few bits of housekeeping to mention in the beginning. These are that. We've got people online as well as here in the room. Uh, so you'll see various um, perspectives on the screen up there. The emergency exit is in the corner of the room over there. Assembly point is on the far side of the car park uh, and toilets are at the end of the corridor on the right with an accessible toilet to the right of the lift. Tea, coffee and water in the corner as usual. Uh, tonight, Paul is clerking. Laura uh, and Sarah and Rachel will manage the question board, the participant settings and generally the IT. Always keeping our fingers crossed. Um, we're being recorded and we'll be live streaming on YouTube as soon as Sarah presses the button and she will give us a nod. If you are attending via Zoom, can you use your yellow hand button for questions and, if, and ask and everyone else through the Q&A board? Obviously, everyone else just hands up. Um, it's a quite a packed agenda tonight, so I'll be keeping firmly to time, as usual. Um, and we've got some really interesting things, so it should be a good meeting. Um, first thing on the agenda is any declarations, uh, uh, any apologies for absence, and I don't think we have had any, have we? So none, we've got a few people perhaps running a bit late. Um, secondly, we need to have declarations of councillors' interests. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, I'm a director of Cultivating Communities and as such have an interest in the Vicky Park Cafe piece, item five. Brilliant, so when we come to discuss that later on, um, we'll ask you to leave the room um, and then we'll welcome you back with open arms as soon as we're done. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, and then, uh, next is approval of the minutes from the last meeting on 7th of September 2022. So I need a proposer. A oh, sorry. Paul's got a suggestion. Oh, yes. So, uh, um, yeah, um, the, the minutes that you have in front of you excluded this bit where we were talking about the Froome Birthing Unit. So the sort of the, the suggestion from me is that we, we add to that section starting um two two things actually the, the, because we've now got a video uh on youtube the the verbatim uh link is there so i'm suggesting from now on we add that into the minutes and uh secondly the the minutes should include that section starting with charlotte um that's a suggestion from me we, we left out the minutes by mistake last time so we'll need a proposer if that's acceptable i think so and i think we do have a proposer for that do we Carla, thank you. A seconder, Fiona, thank you. And everyone in favour, up your red cards. That looks <laughs> unanimous. That's yeah. unanimous. That's yeah. unanimous. Yeah. We're straight on to point two now then, that's decided. Yep. yep. Okay. Um, item two, as usual, is questions and comments from the public and councillors. Je yes, Jill. Where would we be without your questions? Well, I expect you may be beside the leaf and see what's at the end of our meeting. Yeah, it should not be here, thank goodness for that. It's just a few old chestnuts, but I'll give them to report that the gated area in our open space in Boundary Barton, the padlock has been obviously coded and it's gone and it's been accessed and the ivy is being peeling off the wall. It needs attention and it needs that gate needs to be locked again. I can't hear you online. Okay. Right. Okay, then. So I have made a point about the gate not having its padlock anymore. Um, I just wanted to um, ask Peter Wheelhouse if um, there's any more progress on having a town centre post office now that it has been permanently closed? I don't know that we have an answer to that at the moment, do Paul? Can you come back to me on that, I, Peter, tonight I, uh, or not? Jill, Jill, I'll come back to you on that. Um, as far as I know, we haven't made any progress. Okay. 
right. Okay. And also, and I, I mentioned to Paul just now regarding the um, metal images of St. Oldham that were moved when the town centre was realigned. And I gather they're in storage, but they are hopefully going to be put onto a wall somewhere. I wondered if there's any progress on that. No, but they're safe and sound. They're not going to be lost. And we're just trying to find the most appropriate place to put them. Okay. It, it, actually, Jill, if, if you could, yes. if you have any thoughts on where they could go, not necessarily now, but let, let me know. because I have, uh, I Actually, I did go round and a couple of us, Pat Taylor, you may remember, she's ooh, been up ooh. here and she's equally concerned. And we did go round and we have made a couple of suggestions, but brilliant. either thank nobody you. listened or whatever. We always listen. Thank, thank you, Paul. Thank you. Just another um, another slight problem that I think you're short on town rangers and we need to plant what was going to be our jubilee tree, but it will still be in commemoration of the Queen and um, well, of the late Queen. And we need it planted in the area at Foundry Barton. Again, we, we can only plant that in the planting season, which is the winter, but that will well, happen this winter. winter. Well, it's in a pot. It's a magnolia tree mm. and it is about 10 foot tall and it needs a big hole dug for it. And we're not strong enough to do it. We need some town rangers to do it. Sure thing. Right. OK. Right. Thanks very much, Jill, as always. Um, OK. Yeah. Mel first and then Anita and then I'll come back for the next ones. I've got two questions. The first one is... Um, Microphone. Stick. Uh, our MP, David Warburton, has been uh, euphemistically missing uh, for over six months. Could the town clerk invite him or his representative to attend the next council council meeting to inform the people of Froome and the council about his current and future position as a member of parliament? That's the first, and I'm assuming you can do that. Yeah, thank you. Well said. <laughs> Second question, which is probably less significant, but uh, can the town clerk invite the owners of the former shoe zone site, whom I believe to be one, uh, one part at least of the NHS, to attend the next council meeting too, to explain their proposal for the building, which has now been empty for five years and is a blight on the town? Yeah, noted. Thanks very much, Mel. Anita? Thank you. Uh, I think I'm right in saying that down at Welsh Mill uh, on the riverbank, one of the life belts is missing. I think it's been missing for a long time. Um, I don't know what the plans are to renew it, but it, it really should be there for the sake of safety. OK, nice. thanks, Anita. Um, Mick Dunk, I think I've got you next on, on the list and then I'll come back to any hands up. No, you've got a microphone. Um, yes, it was it was basically prompted by um, the thought that this winter we might be in for some extraordinary um, work from people like the the CA and the, and the CSE actually. If anyone that the the, the it's called, used to be called CAB, it's the Citizens Advice now, uh, and uh, CSE is the Centre for Sustainable Energy. Anyway, I was um, trying to ask Mendip if they could put their hand in their pocket or find some some loose notes under the sofa cushions. But um, they sort of came back to me um, saying, well, you know that, that uh, Froome Council has reduced its funding to the CA. So I didn't know that. And so that's what sort of started me off. And that's why I'm here tonight, really. Um, because A, I thought their response was rather unprofessional. I mean, they need to make their own decisions regardless of what any other council is doing. And surely they can, but the tone from them was, sorted at this end and then and then we'll see sort of thing and I thought well that was pretty poor but I know you haven't got a particularly good relationship with Mendip and neither have they with you I think uh, it's fair to say so uh, with that sort of in mind I thought well I'll, I'll go and see if Froome can reconsider um, the funding um, that you have for the CA it's in my opinion it should be something that's annual it's something that's required whether there's a an emergency in the cost of living and mortgages and energy <laughs> or whatever else there is it's something that people need uh, as a service so that for me it's just like you know perhaps you could reconsider that uh, whether it helps me at mendip is another matter 
and I wouldn't worry too much about that, but I'll do my own work on that on that, on that uh, score. But um, apparently, um, Paul Wynn won't mind me saying that I think he's got a meeting lined up with, uh, at some stage, not yet, at some stage with Ian Byworth, who's the head of the CA, and um, I'd be interested to see what the outcome of that is. Okay, Luke. I think that's I think that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Kate Hellard is going to uh, take the question. Um, thanks, Meg. Uh, yes, so um, we have funded, the councillors have funded the Citizens Advice this year through the Substantial Grant Programme. They had um, a total of 19 applications for that grant, which totaled £108,000, and they had £27,000 in the pot. So they made some difficult decisions. Uh, they funded eight of those applications, and they funded all of them at 50% of what they were asking for. But um, we have been having ongoing conversations about where our role is in terms of the cost of living and what Freem Town Council can do. As you rightly say, Citizens Advice is a key partner in that, as are a number of others. And at our last, uh, maybe one before council meeting, councillors agreed for the next round of the substantial grants to specifically be dedicated to cost of living projects. So we have in train um, some conversations that are happening, which will include a conversations with citizens advice, um, which builds on our ongoing dialogue with them really. In the meantime, I've also spoken to Mendip and understand that their officers are doing a similar thing. Um, so they're having a meeting this week. Uh, I may join them if I can, but the, the dialogue is the same. What do we collectively need to do to support the various funding streams that Citizens Advice have? They're funded from a couple of departments in the County Council, as you know, will know, and the district, um, and then Town Council. So how do we work together to better use that funding to best support the residents in Frame? really is the question. And uh, there's an open dialogue there with Ian Byworth, who's the chief exec of um, Mendip Citizens Advice. Does that answer your question, Mick? It's, it's a very good answer. Good start. <laughs> Thanks. Shane, you had your hand up just then. Uh, yes. A bit of um, exciting sewage news from the last uh, Mendip full council meeting. Um, we got a motion passed. Um, <laughs> sorry, actually, that, that was... That wasn't many. Uh, uh, asking, requesting Wessex Water to tell us how much sewage will be produced from new developments, which at the moment you know they don't have to do, um, which will give the planning board a better idea of whether new developments are likely to cause sewage overflows into the rivers, um, and also ask Mendip Planning to keep a sort of cumulative total of all the sewage from all the different developments coming out because amazingly at the moment planning departments don't have to keep cumulative totals and as we've seen on the river wire with the profusion of chicken farms it kills rivers so although sewage is not a material consideration in planning it should give the planning board a, a better idea if Wessex choose to respond to our request whether new developments are going to cause river overflows sewage overflows Thank you, Shane. I think I saw some hands up over there. Yes, sir. Yes. I'm here with a small bunch of people who are from all over Froome in various streets around here, including Weymouth Road, actually. So no guesses as to what this subject is all about. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm Tristan, and I'm just going to ask you a question. In the light of a recent petition with over 400 local signatures, local press coverage, unanswered emails to Steve Deakin of Somerset County Council Parking, with mounting video evidence of congestion around Weymouth Road and increased speeding down Weymouth Road now, we believe this parking scheme is causing more problems than it actually solves. The safety concerns that justified this scheme have now created a freeway in one of Froome's widest streets with a higher proportion of off-street parking, which appears undemocratic and biased. We understand that the Town Council will have some input into the statutory review of the new scheme on permits in Weymouth Road. How is the review going to be administered? And will this represent us 
in making sure our criticism, which I think is constructive and observed and has lots of anecdotal and video evidence, how is that going to be heard, please? Thank, Thank you. Question, Tristan, I'm going to give you to Paul for that one. Yeah, I, I think I think a lot of councillors would share your concern um, about about this this uh, this this project. Um, the answer about how the review will be carried out, uh, we are trying to to get the answer to that from Steve Deacon as well. So I don't know, like you at this stage. However, um, I think it's really important that that collectively we collect as much data as possible because it's only the data and the feedback that, that will have any impact on whether or not this pilot continues into permanent um so I, can i can i ask you tristan to, to share all your data with me i'll keep it um and then we can collect other data as well and collectively we can put a case to steve deacon and the county council and and then you know, effectively it's their decision at the end of the day but but I, 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 I think I talk on behalf of the councillors. There is there is a lot of sympathy with your views. Can I just say that the review started, it started on the microphone. Yeah, microphone. Can, you... Can I just say that the review period has actually started? It was due to start on the 19th of September, but it, I guess it will be the 20th, given the significance of the 19th. Um, and that's three months from that date. So we have a very short period of time to do this in. And I think I can speak for all of us. One of our frustrations has been that we have all approached various different people, um, but there just seems to be a very um, disparate, what's the word? Disparate approach. And we would really appreciate any support to pull this together. And it really is about a wide planning uh, review for the entire town, not just our specific streets, because they all interlock and it's hugely important. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm really happy to be the to the conduit to sort of pull all that together on 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 behalf of residents. Um, as, uh, I think uh, okay, but but just just so as if you want to put it to me, I'll I'll make sure it's kept and and we can we can collectively feed into that. Uh, Peter, do you want to add anything? Yes, just uh, this is hot off the press, but I was talking uh, with Steve Deakin this afternoon, and he's um, agreed to come along to the next council meeting in November to provide a briefing on uh, on this topic and to also answer questions. Uh, I know this is something we've been asking for for a while now, but he, he has now agreed, you know, in view of the the uh, the interest in, in this one. Um, so hopefully that will be uh, reassuring both to councillors and to uh, members of the community who are there tonight. Else? Yeah, just, just I'll just check with Laura. The, the next council meeting is on the 16th of November. So so please come along and, and, and it's, hopefully Steve will be there to, to, to answer questions um, and uh, receive views. Is that helpful? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from councillors or members of the public? Anything on the board, Sarah? Oh, sorry, Mark. Following on from Shane's question about water runoff, I had a meeting a few weeks ago with Wessex Water. You may or may not have noticed, I'm sure Jill has, but behind the Westway shopping centre, there's a lot of digging going on at the moment with Wessex Water. Last year, they had 42 instances of stormwater runoff directly into the river. The measures they're taking there will reduce that to an average of 10 from now on diverting it down to the sewage works they can't limit it completely apparently but that's as good as they can get it and that's the work they're doing there at the moment thank you mark anything else before we move on to the next item okay thank you so next we have uh, a short presentation from david lastman uh, from Froome museum and this is about the Froome horde coming back to Froome. very exciting david lastman Right, just check in. Everybody hear me okay? Lovely. Oh, um, yeah. no, no. Oh, David, press the green button. Oh, there yeah. uh, I'm from the museum. I only <laughs> I don't know this modern technology. That's that's better, yeah. Okay. 
Um, first thing, I know there's a lot of people online watching and I have been asked to wave to them, so that's for them. Um, but thank you for inviting me to talk um, about the Froome Horde. And um, the next slide, please. Just to give you a very brief history lesson, uh, in AD 305, in a field quite near Froome, um, apparently this big blue pot was put into the ground. Um, it was meant to be an offering to the gods. You threw the, the money in. It was never um, intended to be retrieved. Uh, and there it stayed. Next slide, please. Until 2010, when Dave Crisp came along, metal detectorist, and um, he discovered what is now known as the Froome Horde. Um, and it's called the Froome Horde. It was actually should have been called something else because it was discovered in a small village outside Froome. Not small, sorry. A village outside Froome. But um, to stop everybody coming down the hordes, no pun intended, descending on this small village, they called it the Froome Horde. Um, but there's Dave in the Froome Museum when um, some of the coins were exhibited. And um, this was 2010. And apparently, I believe, around 2,000 people came through the library in two hours. Um, what you don't see is all the security guards um, around because it's worth about 300,000 pounds. But anyway, next slide, please. So that's 200, well, 2010. Um, this is Alan Graham leading the exca excavation. What um, Dave did, as any good metal detector should, once he discovered the, um, the find, he threw a horseshoe in to detect, uh, detract other metal detectorists, got in touch with his local Somerset finds liaison officer, and uh, a professional excavation dig was um, undertaken. And you can see that in the ground coming out. Next slide, please. Um, this is how it was, and what was great about Dave leaving it, leaving it in the ground was the fact that they could take it out and there were layers upon layers upon layers and they were able to date um, the coins, as you can see, uh, 50, over 52,000, um, one of the largest finds hoards ever found in Britain, and the coins dated from about 253 to about 305 AD. So that's um, 2010. Next slide, please. 2011 Museum of Somerset um, raised the money, and I think quite a few organizations in Froome um, contributed towards that, but they raised 320,000 just above that with, I think, lottery funding as well, and they were able to acquire the, the hoard because it was declared treasure, and it now at the moment sits in the Museum of um, Somerset in Taunton. Next slide, please. 2017, the hoard is declared the nation's favorite treasure. Um, it was it was by the readers of the ta Daily Telegraph, so, so <laughs> make of that what you would. But uh, there's the headline, it's the nation's favorite treasure. Um, uh, next slide, please. 2022, the museum starts um, talks with Southwest Heritage to, uh, to loan the Froome Hoard. And um, if all goes well, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, next slide, please. 2024, the Froome Hoard is hopefully on display um, as part of a wider engagement project. And along with Bath, the town becomes a must-see tourist attraction for those interested in Roman artifacts. It must be stressed, though, um, the discussions with Southwest Heritage and other key stakeholders are in the very early stages. Um, and there needs to be a lot of work undertaken by the museum to make sure that we can realize this ambition of bringing the hoard um, to the town in 24. The plan for the hoard as it presently stands would be for a six month loan period, um, but a wider engagement program that runs alongside it or would due to run aside it would have much longer prolonged effects on the community. So if I could just say a little bit about that and, and heritage, heritage is often dismissed as literally a thing of the past. Um, but more and more it's being seen as taking its rightful place within the tools to be used for the well-being of our local communities. And the project that will accompany the Froome Horde is just one of many engagement initiatives that the town will see in a couple of years time. Um, this includes, next slide please. Um, I'll just actually say about the Froome project. You might have seen um, Watley Villa, um, and also the Froomefield Barrow and uh, an Iron Age site at Blacklands. And also there's, there was the lead um, road plus the Bath Pool um, Road. So although Froome wasn't a, a Roman town as such, 
the amount of Roman presence in the area is huge. Um, and the, the, one of the projects will be from academic project to, um, to see what actually went on there in the Roman presence plus engagement of the community. Um, next slide, please. Just checking my time. Um, so some of the initiatives, Froome, Froome Local um, History Festival is starting next year with um, Woven in Time, Woolen Industry theme. And the year after, the uh, hopefully Froome Horde will um, be part of that theme in conservation. And also um, through medical practice, just asked me to make the town council aware that um, with their local uh, health connector scheme, which was so successful and was worldwide known, they're trying to roll out a heritage um, equivalent. And so that's exciting, that might be next year, but they asked me to mention that to you, just to let you know what's going on. So in terms of Froome, it literally, Froome history, it punches above its weight. Next slide, please, I think. No, nope, that's the end, back. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't finished, I got a couple of minutes. Um, so in terms of Froome history, literally punches above its weight. Uh, and any ambition for the town to utilize this should not only focus on attracting the people outside, but engaging the people within, the communities within. Um, and the coming winter, as we all know, we we'll see various crises starting to bite even deeper. And where it's going to drive a lot of people into despair um, and, and depression and basically kind of, um, sorry, there is another word, I do apologize, um, isolation, sorry. Um, hopefully heritage can be used to connect people and also give hope and, and um, joy. And one small example I'd like to just share with you, those of you that, that uh, follow the Froome Facebook page, I actually put a couple of excerpts from a policeman's um, book from the, his memoirs from the 70s last night. Um, and within 24 hours, hundreds of people have engaged with it, have shared it or commented it, and it's brought friends back, school people that hadn't seen each other for years. So just that small example just shows what kind of heritage can do looking back at the past. So the last thing I'll say um, is from this standpoint, I'd ask members of the town council when you're thinking about strategic aims and plans for the future of Froome, it's not only to think of um, heritage as a major aspect of that, but also to include it and support it. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, David. That was fascinating. Any questions, Nick? Hi, David. Um, my name's Nick Dove. I'm one of the town councillors. Really, really interesting. Thanks very much. I like the thing you put out today about policing. Kind of interesting to see what the police presence was in Froome years ago compared with now. It's just two PCs. Um, <laughs> one of the things we're trying to look at is how we increase footfall in the town to get more visitors in, spending money, spending time here. So this would be a real attraction. I think there seem to be a lot of people out there with uh, metal um detectors etc but also really interested in the history of the region so i think it's a brilliant idea and i really welcome it thank you sure good thanks i mean there are yeah Froome finders as i said we we're only just scratching the surface no pun intended on the amount of roman presence that there was actually in Froome. um i know aldham traditionally founded it in 685 but the romans were here a lot earlier yes oh. Hi, um, agree. Again, really interesting presentation. I'm just curious, what, there's obviously the Froome Museum in Froome. Are there, is there a sort of a history society? Are there other groups? Is, do metal detectors kind of, is there a society? Are there sort of groups? Yeah, I think there's a, a metal detectors society. Um, there is the Froome Society for Local Study. Um, that's been going since 1958. They, they do a lot of research and run lecture programmes. In fact, I think in the latest Froome Times, um, there's a piece on the lecture program which starts this Saturday, um, I believe. There's um, various family history groups. There's um, local history groups. There's a Keyford local history group. So, um, I mean, what I was tasked with by the Froome Medical Practice was to, to, to basically map the list of possible organisations that are related with heritage. And um, it's, it's a very large list. I mean, Froome, as I said, is very uh, punches above its weight and um, it's got huge history, uh, capability and potential. Yeah, have I got the authority to... Yeah, go ahead, your, go, right, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Thanks. Um, yes. Okay, right. Um, a talk. Uh, why not? Because you're here. Why don't we say that we, we support the um, return of the Froom Horde to Froom, uh, and then you can use that in publicity or arguments later on. So if we could, we could 
perhaps take an informal um, show of hands in terms of the council? Would that be helpful? That, that would be very helpful. I mean, to be honest, I did actually had a meeting with South West um, Heritage Trust this afternoon, and um, I did say I was presenting tonight. And they said, you know, if you could exactly what you're saying, that they know you're on board, that will help because we're going to be doing some funding bids. So that would be help to know that, um, you know, you're on, you're on board as a council. Thank you. Mel, can you just clarify that, what you're asking? And we will do it, Steve. I'll come back to you then in two secs. Council supports the, um, so can we, board as soon as possible. So can we all vote on whether we support that now informally? Yeah. Lovely to see. Yes. Yay! <laughs> Um, Tracy first and then Steve. Um, Councillor Tracy Ashford, um, one of the things I'm often interested in is how we um, involve the arts in um, things in, in Froome. I found what you said very interesting and um, I remember coming with my daughter when she was really very small to um, hear the talk about the Froome Horde and I've been reading your policeman posts as well. Right. Um, maybe there's room to um, create some, um, recreate some characters and perhaps have um, living actors uh, on events or something. Um, maybe we could find some way of um, bringing some of their um, history and their speeches from the past into some actors, be they professional or amateur in the room, and um, add that in as part of the um, attraction for tourists and people. Fant yeah, no, fantastic idea. Thank you. Um, Steve, you were next. Yeah, hello, David. Um, Steve Tanner again, councillor here. Um, I'm part of um, Friends of From Station, From Station Friends Group, and I've been talking to a couple of people at the museum about doing a historical timeline of the station. Sure. Um, we've also got the Railway Heritage Trust coming down to see us in a few weeks' time, so it'd be great to link all of that in together um, to, to sort of put some... Uh, uh, so something about the uh, the historical sort of um, basis of the station and how it came about. Brilliant, yeah. No, that would be in contact with about that. Yeah, no, that would be brilliant because I, I think I was speaking to a couple of people in the museum and and they mentioned that and I said that I'd try and get in touch. So that would be good to uh, open the communication. Thank you. Um, I think did you have uh, Phil on? first and then oh, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 sorry, just, sorry. No, really. <laughs> Hi, David. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Uh, Philip Companion, one of the town councillors. Um, I'm just, you may well have already covered this, um, but uh, I'm just looking at the education angle here. Sure. In terms of uh, once it's in Froome, the hood is in Froome, and then to link with all the schools in Froome, uh, first schools right the way up through uh, Froome College, um, and also uh, the possibilities of some uh, funding might come through various um, educational organisations, uh, history society and so on and so on. Um, so if that's something that you've done, great. Um, if not, that's something worth exploring. No, definitely. I mean, we've basically, we've got the outline or timeline um, we were discussing this afternoon. Basically, from now until the end of the year, we're kind of putting together the plans. And then I think early spring, we're going to approach the National Heritage Lottery by that time, well, it, it sounds quite great. We've got, we've got a national security advisor <laughs> coming down to the museum to see if we're hoard worthy um, and, <laughs> and what, what the museum has to do, if, if not, to, um, to bring it up. So obviously it can be safely displayed there. But um, as I say, this kind of is the, um, the, the period of time to the end of the year where we're getting our plans together. But certainly then we would be looking for funding from various organisations and the educational project is, is at the heart of that. It's, it's taking something out to the schools um, or them coming to us. But um, thank you for that. I'm glad I was able to clarify. Shane. Can, can the, um, the coins be taken out of the hoard when they're on the display? And the other question is, are they all Roman coins or did the Dumnoni and the British tribes have it's, coins? It's pretty much Roman. I mean, the, the theory Sam Moorhead from the British Museum has is that um, during this particular period where the, the um, pot was put into the ground, there were some, um, I think, secular games and so it was a case that you would, I mean, it, it was quite near a Roman road. So we think, or, or Sam Moorhead thinks that they'd be walking along and would give offerings to the gods and would throw them in. And, and it, because it was 305, that would have been right in the middle of the Roman period. There, there might have been, well, there might have been some Jersey coins or some, you know, some other people throwing um, some denarii in or whatever, but mainly it was Roman coins. 
um, from the period I said, 253 to 305. But I mean, it's, it's very exciting, as I said, that, that kind of the, the headline um, kind of story with the Froom Horde, but the amount of other stuff that has been discovered or, or is being discovered. I mean, eight, eight coins were, eight silver coins were discovered last week um in in a field near Froome but but watch this space kind of thing so it, it is giving it is starting to give up its secrets um and hopefully as I said we can won't obviously compete with Bath but we could be um Bath younger younger sibling in terms of Roman and attraction. cooler and, and will the coin <laughs> and cooler and will cooler. the coins be taken out of the pot so you can um they are they are right I mean basically the British Museum um I do I do kind of lectures on uh, well, I do history courses and that. And when I do that, there is pictures of all of them being dried. They they were driven up, I think, by Sam Moorhead's in Sam Moorhead's car to the British Museum and, and um, busted sp- suspensions doing it, I think, um, but got them back and they had to be dried within a certain time. And, and they were able to separate them all because they were obviously in a big mess, but they've all been separated. Our hope, I believe, um, I think I'm right in saying is, is that we want s- some examples of every kind of period along along with the pot um so yeah they are they are out of the pot um brilliant thank you we'll just take one more one more from mick dunk just very very quickly uh i got fired up about history when i was very very young they took us on a field visit to hampton court palace and a guy actually showed us uh some real tudor stuff and i i just seeing it you know, is believing, as you say. You know, you see the real object. You, sometimes you can fit, so museums do this thing where you can touch real exhibits as well. Sure. Sometimes, but uh, no, it's great. And I wanted to know, uh, I don't know why the container is blue. Isn't that unusual for this era of pottery? Um, it was because it got wet in the ground. It's not really blue. Ah, um, I don't. But, but I think that was ah. maybe maybe a desire. But don't tell anybody. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, no, it's 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 very very startling. But um, I think it was more grey. Um, there was a discussion about it, and we probably don't think it was blue originally. Okay, well, I think I'm right in saying. That pretty much puts my mind at rest. Thank you very much. Yep, yep. Um, thank you so much, David, for that fascinating and obviously a lot of um, interest and enthusiasm for it in the room. So thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, from the past to the future, we're having a section now on digital inclusion. We're going to be hearing from Councillor Sarah Dyke and then from Will Palmer at Health Connectors. Uh, going to be introduced by Councillor Anne Hills. Hello. Yes, Anne Hills, Councillor of Town Council. Um, I've had a, a series of, of meetings and discussions with Will and then Sarah and Simon as well about what's going on with digital inclusion, also maybe known as the digital divide or digital poverty, many, many names um, discussing all of these aspects of whether you have access to the digital age or not. Um, And I don't want to take up any more of their valuable time. And they're going to talk about what they're doing in other areas of Somerset, as well as in Froome, and some ideas of how we might bring some of those those, um, projects to Froome. Um, Evening, everybody. Nice to see some familiar faces um, around the room and online, or there was online. Um, We have some slides, obviously. Um, Oh, myself. I was hoping to do the next slide, please. (laughs) By all means. I've never never done the next slide, please. (laughs) I I want to do the next slide, please. Um, So just to quickly introduce myself to the people who who don't know me. uh, My name is Sarah Dyke. I'm a uh, South Somerset District Council councillor, where I have the portfolio for environment. I'm also a recently elected um, Somerset County councillor, where I have the, um, or I am the lead member for environment and climate change. Uh, and I'm also, for my sins, the parliamentary candidate for the Liberal Democrats uh, here in Somerton and Froome. So um, if we don't find our MP, then um, <laughs> you might be seeing a lot more of me. Here's, here's hoping. Um, but today I specifically wanted to talk to you about a project that uh, I've been working on um, probably for the last 18 um, or so months. And um, I'm really proud of it. Um, it has grown um, massively since um, I first set it up back in 
um, uh, I'm going to say January 2021, Simon reckons it was March, but uh, um, so it, it started literally with me setting up in my district ward down in, in Melbourne Port, which is um, down towards Sherbourne on the um, Somerset Dorset borders. Um, so I just want to take you on a pretty much of a whirlwind trip of um, um, how it started, why it started uh, and where we are now and how hopefully Froome um, uh, can engage with, with this scheme um, as, uh, as, as we think it's absolutely, absolutely marvellous. So um, I will be speaking for, for, for a few slides. I then introduce Simon Barfoot, who is um, from Donate IT, who is a, 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 I'm very lucky to have as a, as a very good friend of mine. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll finish off at, at, at the end. So oh, next slide, please. <laughs> So, okay, so back in um, early 2021, um, we are, it was clear that there was a big problem uh, around, there was uh, lots of kids, as we know, um, suffering um, in, in their homes, fighting over one device, a phone or a laptop or whatever it was, children trying to um, learn um, different age groups, fighting over that one, one bit of IT. So, uh, you know, we know that there's so much of uh, our lives now rely on our phones. I forgot mine, so it's at home. Um, so I couldn't phone to say that I was going to be late. But, you know, I really felt quite anxious when I was driving around. I was like, oh, I'm halfway here and I haven't got my phone. Um, but, you know, game device, so you know learning but also um you know access to services so people older people who who, who now need to be able to um get to the, get a doctor's appointment or get their medication or whatever it, whatever it is certainly during lockdown we saw that all of that was now um, needed to be done um during um uh, you know, over, with a with a piece of it and obviously you know, a lot of people just didn't have that connectivity. So alongside that, um, it's estimated that um, every household is hoarding <clears throat> five or more bits of, uh, of IT. Um, sadly, probably not as valuable as our, as our, our previous speakers um, hoard. Um, but, you know, mobile phones, we've all got them, game devices, old laptops that we simply think, oh, I might just use that one day and never ever do, because obviously before we know it, we've bought something else. So all of these are just kind of gathering dust. They've got high embodied energy stored in them. They've got precious earth metals and many of them are still viable, um, but yet let, they're just sat at home doing absolutely nothing. And then when we do pick them up out of our um, attics or spare rooms or under the bed or wherever we find them, they usually go into landfill. Now, as for me, that makes me feel really uncomfortable when we're just shoving all of this um, you know, resource under the ground and hiding it away. So essentially, I was like, OK, we've got, a, we've got a need here. We've got people who need this IT and we need to keep it out of landfill as, where as, as much as possible. So next slide, please. So back in early 2021, I approached Simon and I said, look, Simon, you're, you're an expert in, in IT. He's been running, running a um, computer recycling company for the last 25 years. So I thought, you know, he's probably as good as anybody to, to talk about this kind of stuff. And we both got together and Simon was very much thinking along the same lines, you know, the same kind of problems he was seeing in the, in the general day-to-day -day work um, that he was doing. So we got our heads together and it didn't take very long for us to kind of look at a really simple scheme around how we might um, kind of try and stop this, this problem. So um, next slide, please. So essentially it's a really simple scheme. We've, we have local groups. So I set my first one up in Melbourne Port. So local group, which was myself at the time, partnering with the parish council, um, collected old IT. So the, the parish council said, yeah, we'll, we'll use our um, office as a collection point. So a pickup point where people could just drop their old, old IT. At the time, obviously we were in lockdown. So I was driving around to people, which was great for me because I was able to, as their local representative, go and talk to people, have a quick chat with people obviously um, socially distant pick up their IT everybody thought they were doing a fantastic thing because nobody could really do very much else um, during lockdown they, everybody was delighted to give me their their IT um, then I would then 
keep it secure and obviously the, the, the parish council will keep that IT secure because in some cases it still has data on it and obviously people are quite nervous about their, um, their, their own data. Simon has taught me that that is called toxic data which I you know, kind of think is, is uh, uh, pretty severe but it's really important we, we keep that safe. Um, then it goes from me or the collection point straight to donate IT so there's that kind of security all the way through and then Simon will immediately as soon as it gets it into his, his a workshop and warehouse will data cleanse that and, and Simon will go into a little bit more detail and a little bit more about how that process works so then Simon will refurbish or um, recycle the IT. So where we can refurbish bits of IT, they will then be refurbished and then put back out into the community. And obviously where they can't be used anymore, we'll recycle that. Each of those component parts have a value. That value then is brought back into the scheme and we're then able to buy new bits of kit, so maybe um, geo books or Chromebooks or whatever it is that the schools need. And then that is, is then given out to, to um, the community. And then it's that local group again, who then are able to um, determine who has that IT. So it's very much the, 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 the face of the scheme is the local group. Simon does all the, all the back office stuff and then the local group go out and get the PR and decide who, who gets the IT. So it's this you know, circle. So the, the, the IT comes in from local people and then it gets disseminated out to local people who need it. It really is as simple as that. I don't have any, any more involvement in it apart from I'm still coordinating my local scheme. And we've now got lots of schemes all over the place that are you know, just working within, within their local environment. So it's very much for the local group just to take it on and do with it what they will and you've got that skill and expertise um, with with Simon um, to be able to facilitate all that kind of back office um, type work now I have got a quick video but don't worry if it doesn't work because we can signpost you to the donate IT website afterwards and you can watch it but I just wanted to see if it did work um, because it it um, does kind of quick, very quickly showcase what it's all about but if it doesn't it really really doesn't matter um, but also if you know, the whole thing is of this circular economy, which obviously more and more of us are engaging with in now with that kind of, you know, use and reuse and refurbish and just keep things going. Save thousands with, of pounds on your heating hand. bill this winter. This genius way to heat. It's not going to work. It doesn't matter if it doesn't. doesn't work. No, it's not showing, I don't think. It, yeah, it looks great there. Should we just all huddle? huddle um, when you do watch it, do watch it because Simon's got his, his waistcoat on. Um, so, yeah. So, I don't think it's going to work. But I'm. I, so, that's pretty much an introduction to the scheme. We can't get the video working. So, I'll hand over to Simon because he'll pretty much be able to introduce the. Uh, um, into into the back office bit to you, so you've got a bit more of the the, the techie bit. Thanks very much, Sarah. Good evening. Thank you very much for inviting me this evening. Um, Simon Barfoot. My main job is running a company I founded 25 years ago called Blackmore Rico Tech. Um, 40 people employed locally. Um, we are actually very proud to announce that we've recently become the highest possibly accredited data wiping company in the country which is a, a win. Uh, the Info Information Commissioner's Office set a new standard, one to three, and in each one, there's a certain level of uh, accreditation. And we got level three with distinction, first company in the UK. So I'm um, very proud of that. Um, as Sarah said, lockdown, we took Blackmore Recotech and kind of took all the uh, techie parts of it into a packaged version, set it up in its own separate um, secure unit, and we started processing kit for initially children at home um, doing home learning. Um, it completely blew open the fact that lockdown wasn't about um, children learning at home. There is a huge amount of different variety of digital, a digital divide, digital poverty, digital anxiety, people having to access things that they used to be able to get online or rather by post or by going to their council one example is the blue parking badge can only now apply for it online <clears throat> um, and we've begun to work with a lot of different agencies of all sorts of types from human trafficking drug and addiction settling syrians afghans ukrainians um, families in trouble who just need um, digital devices to add to their 
back to their recipes of, of, of quality of life, because we, we give someone a phone or we give someone a tablet, it doesn't fix their problem, but it gives them the tools to fix their problem. And that's what we're talking about here. And it's all driven by what we're given by people who no longer need their kit. We have no grant funding. Our only overhead are the cost of my techies. I'm free, the premises is free, electricity is free. The data wiping software we use, we approached the company that we buy it from and they were so delighted they gave us two free unlimited licenses to use. Um, so we only have the cost of the techies we employ and we employ four techies who are getting uh, technical work in a rural area. Um, they're not the sort of, I won't go into detail, but basically they probably aren't, they weren't having much success getting jobs around here. Um, so there's a little win there. The scheme is as simple as Sarah says. I have campaign groups um, who will have the ear of their local community, be able to make one announcement that hits a lot of people to ask all those people to do one simple thing, which is to get the stuff down somewhere that's safe to drop it off what we call the chain of custody then kicks in that has to get to me without anyone being able to tamper with it so we must know that that equipment which is probably data bearing toxic data is absolutely the term there's no such thing as oh, don't worry about my whatever because everything can be used against people or businesses um, so we're very careful and we're following our own procedures to um, bring the kit from the donation point into our premises where it's triaged um, our systems don't look at the data, computers talk to computers, and they destroy the data to accredited levels. Um, data also hides in a lot of other places, so we shake down carry cases. Um, we got mobile phones from, uh, from the bull ring in Birmingham, um, where their lost property department no longer has umbrellas, it has mobile phones. And in one of them, in the back of it was someone's driving license. That's data because it's a digital form of personal data. We've been in touch with them and we're holding it and we'll see what happens. So data structure, we know what we're doing. If anyone wants to grill me on it, I'm very happy to bore you for a very long time. Um, and, and we are the techie middle bit between a voice and an activity. And the voice is communicating to a community. The activity, which we'll jump in, in a minute, is being, the, being the, the recipe to quality of life improvement. And the digital part of that is not the answer, it's part of the answer. Um, I haven't even spoken about any slides. Yeah. Yes. We have a list of what we can take and we have a list of what we'd rather not take. But we don't turn it away. If, if some person's made all the effort to bring something to us, um, one of the things that we're linked to via our own organisation is the UK circular economy. So I've personally audited every place that we send our downstream product onto um, to make sure that they're doing it correctly, to make sure that it's following best practice and to make sure that all the rare earth minerals and all the, and all the precious metals are being recovered to the highest possible level. Um, we link in back to those companies um, such that if we are given something that, a fax machine, <laughs> I can't give a fax machine away, believe it or not, um, but we have got processes. We have got, the NHS have got a big fax machine problem coming, by the way. Um, but we have got the downstream processes to make sure that it, it is treated correctly. On the left-hand side of the things we can use and we can find homes for, the programme actually is wider than the most programmes. Most programmes say we just want five-year-old, less than five-year-old tablets, phones and laptops, anything else we can't deal with. We're a much wider remit. We will take everything because one of the ways we fund the techies and the kit that we can't find for people so if someone wants a particular type of equipment we'll go and buy it for them is by selling the stuff we can't give away so if it's a bit of comms from a server company or a bit of wi-fi equipment from an ethan from an internet company we will ebay that and that becomes our funding and we run at about three or four hundred pounds a week we have had no other funding in the first year to christmas when sarah got us up and running we did 95 donations i wanted to get to 100 but 95 it was we have now just recently hit 445 in, the, in this year. So we've done another 350 just this year. And that's, oh, sorry, please help. move the slide on. There's a map of the current locations. We have collections, it's out of date. We have to add a few more, but um, I think we're up to 20 now. Um, when Canton have just agreed to the post office there, we got a load on uh, Bridgewater Taunton. Um, and these are our secure sites where there's trusted locations 
that will hold the equipment until I can either arrange collection or we'll hub them back somewhere. And logistics is a little bit of a tricky one, but um, we have we have the, uh, the, the, the resource to, to, to do it. Blackmore has five vans that the insurance company allowed donate to use. So if we need to, we can really mobilize. Um, we haven't needed to equally uh, space capacity is, is quite large. So we're not worried about um, volumes. We operate probably at the moment in about a quarter of this room and we have about two of these rooms available. So I'm not afraid of growth. Next slide. Um, thank you. Yeah, there's so many benefits. Everyone in the process is getting a benefit. The people giving it didn't know what to do with it and they're happy to do it. They know that their data is getting destroyed, so it's protecting them. Um, we're employing local people, which is great. Um, we're saving minerals and metals from going into landfill or other illegal forms of, of recycling, like export. Um, and of course, the agencies and their clients are also benefiting. So it is literally win all the way. We'd yet to see a downside to it apart from my time, which is my time I give, but it's, uh, it's, it's I will have to um, grow the, um, the, the man expectation management side of it where people only inquire to me to uh, ask for equipment, but that's again, manageable. Um, we reckon we've had about two and a half thousand donated devices representing around seven tons of kit. Uh, in fact, I've put five and a half, but that's the stuff that we've diverted from landfill. Um, we've donated over 440 devices. We've got the 19 okay. the local schemes are Brew Valley Rotary Club. We've got um, uh, the SCN campaigner for, for Somerset, Nick Lavis, special education needs, who puts the word around to, to campaign. Um, some church groups with their silver armies who are out there um, uh, campaigning, and they will generate a lot of equipment. Quick example, Castle Carey. Castle Carey, not sure the size of Castle Carey, but they have generated enough kit in their area to give 60 plus devices into their school, their preschool, all of their homeschool children, all of their special education children, which via Nick Lavis, they're all, they're all up and running. There is no real that we know big digital divide left in Castle Carey. We think we've got there because of this campaign they've done. Um, next slide, please. Oh, and there's just a load of pickies <laughs> of, um, of uh, our campaigns. A lot, of, a lot of Ukrainians have been receiving equipment recently um, and Afghans, the Home Office, don't give a budget for resettling people. They don't think IT or phones are a necessity for resettlement. Um, so the campaigns can't buy IT with their budgets. Um, Yeovil for Families, Sue Pocock's a very big campaigner of um, resettlement in the area. And uh, we've been doing a lot with her in the pictures. That picture over there is an Afghan family in Yeovil. So um, a, a huge variety of need in the community. Do we have another slide or is that the one, isn't it? I think it's the PR. And of course, it's very tangible PR because it's smiley people. You can see the device, you can see the route that's led to where it is. And, um, and in its, we've, when we give a device, it's given, there's no um, condition, it's their property. We give it lifetime warranty. Once we fix someone and get them on the right side of the digital divide, we try and keep them there. Um, and um, obviously it, it's life-changing. If we take a seven-year-old child and we give them an 80 pound device here, the trajectory change for their homework that week is tiny, but you take that trajectory over 10 years and you've created a massive difference in someone's quality of life, tax paying ability, professional work, and all those things, just from that little intervention there. Um, <coughs> do I have anything else to add? Is there, is there, are you just gonna wrap up with that? Is that what is the, the ask will, of, of, of us before you? So the ask is if Froome want to communicate to all of their businesses and um, domestic residents, what have you got that you don't need anymore? Collect it somewhere, I will pick it up, and then we can start giving it out again. It's as simple as that, and there's yeah. nothing else to do. It's Essentially be, be a local project. That's, okay. that's what we're looking for. Brilliant, thank you very much for that. I think Will's gonna just give us a little. You can, I have saved a couple of minutes for you if you want, if you've got anything else to add. Um, 
I am a digital connector for Health Connections Bendit. Dave very kindly spoke about it in his presentation. Um, I am the local partner. I already do this within the community. I've distributed up to 80 devices that we've been given by other sources. Um, we're in the process of giving away free SIM cards for up to six months, free calls, free texts, free data um, for those in need. Um, so that's an ongoing program. So I will be the local group. Um, that I have experience in. And without even promoting it, without doing anything, Simon's already given me five devices um, from references from referrals from the medical practice, YMCA and Actum in Touch. I'll just tell you about two people. One, a young guy from the YMCA whose phone was broken, stolen, whatever, didn't have any data. Simon gave us the phone. We had the SIM card. He can now apply for jobs online when he wants at any time. Another um, single mother who's living in a three bedroom house in Froome, who's got five children, um, one of whom is a young daughter who's pregnant and another baby who's got cystic fibrosis. Her phone is completely uh, broken and she had no data, she couldn't afford anything. We are now giving her a phone with data and now she's applying for housing online at her own time. Um, these are really, really important um, interventions and I think, think of it as a digital food bank. That's it, thank you. Thank you very much. Just coming into questions. Um, Sarah, was there anything you wanted to say to wrap up before we go to questions? Did you have anything to add? Okay, great, thanks. That was all really interesting. Questions, Andy, your hand shot straight up. Yeah, just occurred to me, hugely supportive of the, the concept and the program, um, but I think you know, we should also make it clear that we're not quite ready for everybody to drop off their PC at the town hall. Yeah, that's obviously something we'll need to discuss in detail. But yes, thank you for that. Fiona. Um, I just had a question. Obviously, um, especially with older people who might need it, there's, there's perhaps sometimes an educational aspect to it as well in terms of learning how to use the equipment. I'm not in any way, I think what you're doing is absolutely fantastic and I don't want to sort of add to workload. I'm just wondering whether that has ever come up and whether a solution has been discussed or whether... Yes, it has. Okay. It's something which we already do. Clearly a number of people who are disadvantaged or um, excluded are over 75 um, and we already uh, help them on a one-to-one -one basis. I help them, whether it's in their homes, in a cafe. We have a digital cafe in Froome every Thursday. Um, which is a drop-in service. Where but is that? It's in Cheese and Grain. Um, but I will go to people's houses, um, referred from the health connectors or the nurses or doctors or, or many local groups. So yes, we, we address that issue. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nick was first, then Anita. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Um, I guess two things. One is to say thank you, particularly Simon. appreciate your giving up your own time. Obviously, Sarah and Will doing stuff you're, you're kind of massively rewarded by the public sector of course but thank you so much people like you just quietly get on with it i know um the thing is why can't we do it now what's stopping us i know andy you're cautious but what's what what is it that we would need is it a secure room or a what i'm i'm not sure what i mean we have a secure room i mean do we need it though if if it, if if it's going so well at the moment yeah, I think I mean, if you referred to the number of devices. Yes, I think we probably need a secure room. Um, I think we need to manage the logistics about flow in and out. Um, so there's, this is a, a working group which um, needs to consider various numbers of factors. But as I said, I'm, I've already asked Simon for a number of devices. I'll continue to do so. Um, and I'm sure that there is a demand in Froome and probably surrounding villages, but certainly in Froome um, for that. So we're, we're ongoing with it. Thank you. Anita? Um, just to say thank you so much. I think this is such a wonderful project uh, and I think it's got so much scope and I'm delighted to think that we may be contemplating taking this on. I think it's absolutely crucial for all the groups in Froome that, uh, that we need to help with this one way or another. So I'm just really thinking a bit, and I suppose it's probably, um, I'm going to answer my own question, I think. Uh, about some sort of after sales service that's probably asking a bit much but what happens if a device goes wrong do we just say we'll dump it and they'll have to apply for another one or is there any sort of after sales service that you can provide absolutely lifetime warranty we've got nick lavis phones me up all the time and says this this child just put a password on i can't remember it no problem we'll swap the laptop out and start again it's no problem yeah 
Thank you very much. Can, I, first? can I just add, sorry, Sarah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I just wanted, just wanted to add that every um, one of our different groups has different models. So there's, there's so much <laughs> going on out there that there's so many different templates that we can signpost you to so many different groups who work in all, all in slightly different ways. So there's not one model that that, that fits all. Uh, and just come back on, on Nick's point that um, I, I, I took on this project as an activist in my own time, not on public sector. <laughs> hey, I just add, thank you. I know you. One example of that is that um, one campaign have an amnesty day where I turn up in a van and that's the day you bring it. So you could possibly have a, a, a day that you build up to say this is your donate day, I'll be here, big fan, answer questions and that's possible. Brilliant, Mick and then Mel. Have you got a microphone? Yeah. Sorry, I don't want to have any other mix in the room. Um, it, fantastic. Well, thanks to all the presenters. It's a really great idea. And in fact, I wondered if I dropped off my old laptop at the one in Warminster. Is that one of your pickup points as a school in Warminster? Yeah, Barbara on the reception at King Down School. Yeah, I, I think take it been, off you. Yeah, the, the graphics card went and I, I didn't know what to do with it. And I found this thing online. I think it's called Donate It and found the drop off point. Yeah. So. Brilliant, because uh, I was feeling really bad about having it uh, burning a hole in the carpet or whatever. And I didn't want to take it to the dump, because even if you put it in the electrical thing, you don't really know uh, where it's going to go. And, and so, fantastic project. I did ask a question at Mendip about what happens to all our old laptops. And I was told that they have a company who take them, and I don't think they recycle them. And to me, that was very disappointing. And uh, there's a lot of district councillors going to be handing their laptops back in the end, uh, you know, the end of March, beginning of April. And I don't want to hear council saying, oh, we can't do anything because of the data on it and stuff like that, because you have just told us that you are very good at securing computers and clearing the data. I don't want to hear an excuse from any of the district councillors about why they can't donate to you. Thank you. And Mel. A quick one. Uh, obviously, two elements to this. One is the distribution, uh, and the other one is the collection. And it seems to me it's the collection that you're asking us to uh, to get involved in tonight. And I agree with Nick, actually. After a short little working group, I don't see why we can't say that we're going to do this sometime next month. And they could go all go in your walk-in safe or <laughs> your room. <laughs> Per perfectly secure. Uh, so, uh, you know, the sooner we get onto it, the better. And with Christmas coming up, uh, you know, and we could advertise it um, really quite widely. Yes. So to, to reassure you, we're not afraid of any growth. I've got several staff who live in the room. They're all my collection teams from work, work. They've been already working with Will for um, logistics. So uh, uh, it's very doable, yes. One more quick question from Phil. Oh, and then one last one from Max. Thank you. Um, just a very quick administrative point. Um, if we're starting this campaign, um, we could end up with uh, members of the public just giving us their digital devices, which I would be very reluctant to do. So presumably, if this is the safe house drop off, do you have to have named people that take it? I'm just thinking about how it would actually physically work in this building, because can they just hand it in at reception? Or is it like Barbara at Kingdown, where I used to teach? Or is it a named person that would basically sign for it? The collection sites or drop-off locations um, just need to have a secure location where they can hand over equipment to someone who can then put it in the secure location. Um, Glen Cairn House in Sherborne is a osteopathic clinic. Um, they're not professionals in any way other than people who give them kit. They turn around, put it in a secure box. When the box gets full, they let me know I collect it. There's, there's no real um, names needed for that. It's based on a design as opposed to a person. Yeah, the thing I was thinking about was that, to me, was almost like the weakest part of the chain, because if, if you're handing it over to somebody, you would have to be, you have to know that that, not just a secure space, but a secure person is handling it. That was, that was all. Perhaps, yeah, we can deal with the detail when it comes down to it. But yeah, good point. Last question, Max. Not really a question, just more of a comment, I guess. So it's a fantastic scheme and thank you. Um, uh, the only point I'd make is that um, when we talk about digital inclusion, it's more than that is more than um, device ownership. It's also the capacity to be able to connect to places. And so I think one of the issues that we mustn't forget, especially from the local community network point of view, is the lack of connectivity 
you know, beyond the beyond the boundaries of Froome, a lot of the stuff in the rural areas, for example, people will find it very difficult to connect into services, even if they have devices. So we shouldn't forget that part as well. I know that's not within your scheme, but as we as we work as a local community network and as a town council, sorting that problem out and working with the new Somerset Council and the new Unitary to try and solve that problem is a really important element because without it, it means that people have to travel to access services. They can't take advantage of all of the digital channels that we are trying to develop um, because of that lack of connectivity across the area. It's just part of the solution. We're not the fix, but we're... And Sarah, did you have something to say to that? Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's Somerset Waste Partnership have partnered with us. They have a fixie van traveling around rural communities, promoting reuse repair. Which is growing now. Yeah, that's right. Well, I'm, I'm chair of the Somerset Waste Partnership, so I'm really pleased that Fixie Van is is getting out there and, and doing its thing, uh, and um, getting people back on back online, and, and obviously refurbishing some some of these bits of kit. And obviously Simon is is part of that as well. But I also wanted to say around the connectivity. I hope that the scheme will also work with some of the warm room schemes that are happening over over winter as well, so we can get IT in into those rooms, so people then can access IT on site in those warm rooms. Um, while they're having some lunch and, and uh, just generally keeping warm. So I hope that's something that we'll be able to integrate with as, as well. Brilliant. Rewarding and worthwhile work. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm now going to ask Councillor Andy Jones to take his tea and take his leave. What book? Have a nice sit down. We're going to talk about approving the financing for the refurbishment of the Victoria Park toilets and Viv is going to lead on this. Hello. Um, well. oh, it's gone off. You'll have to use mine. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, just a, a brief update first. Um, so, um, in terms of the toilets, the background is that the toilets of Victoria Park have been having increasing vandalism over the last few years, so much so that last week we actually had to close the toilets because there had been some an arson in it, basically a fire which done some internal damage. Um, and so it, it just highlights that, you know, we do need the toilets there, but we need them accessible and usable and the costs involved of having to constantly be replacing the vandalized units and the damage is done is, is becoming a real problem. Uh, we, um, we went to tender in September and we had three submissions. So based on, this, on the tenders, we were now looking, we now have a better understanding of the, of the costs involved of the refurbishment of the toilets. And therefore we are now seeking to make a decision on the financing of this. Um, yeah, the um, the projects itself would, would um, aim to make the toilets more accessible. So we'd be having a changing places unit, also a disabled toilet and unisex toilets, trying to prevent the congregational communal spaces that we have just now, which is where we feel the vandalism is taking place. Um, in terms of financing, um, it's been proposed that um, we would go for a public works loan for, for the project because the EMR that had been earmarked for it will not cover the project costs and we feel this would be better placed on, on in other areas. So it would be to take out a PWRB for £152,000 to go over a 25-year loan with an annual uh, repayment of just over £11,000. Uh, we feel that due to the ongoing replacement of the vandalism and all the hard work that all the cleaners doing, trying to keep the space clean because it's not fit for purpose. This is taking up a lot of time and money in terms of maintenance and hopefully by having better modern design that's fit for purpose, we will have, we'll be able to reduce this, this cost that we have, outgoing costs that we have just now on the maintenance of the toilets because of the state they're in. Um, so that just is, is being uh, predicted around about 10,000 per annum we're spending just now. Uh, and it's hoped that by having a PWLB, there would be no increase to the precinct. Uh, thank you, precinct. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Uh, so the PWLB, the, the uh, 152,000 would cover 
the cost for the toilets refurbishment. So that's a whole project delivered. Um, there would also include a contingency sum. And there's also an additional sum for some uh, refurbishment to the new cafe area, potentially some storage area to help with the cafe projects. So our recommendation to council <coughs> is to approve for the business uh, manager on behalf of FTC to apply for a PWLB for 152,000 uh, to be repaid over 25 years. Thank you. Before we go on to debate that, uh, to propose that, Mark, did you want to add anything to that? And Anita, yeah, I've got your hand. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I want to thank Vivian for getting on with this. This has been going on for a few years now. It's nothing's been done. And a few people in the town and councillors were getting a bit fed up that nothing was being done. So thanks for grabbing this and getting on with it in quite a short space of, ter um, short space of time. Um, I've seen the tenders, they are expensive. It's a lot of money, but that's what they all are. And they were very similar. So I don't think we're being had over. And I know that one, um, there's not much difference in between the cost when you, because it's a, it's a thing. A changing places toilet is a thing. It's a, it comes, it would be the same. Set standard wherever design. It goes yeah. in, whichever building it goes into. Um, I have a question for Sarah about, uh, Sarah, 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 Sarah. <laughs> Too many Sarahs tonight. Um, <coughs> PWLB loan at the moment, you're saying it's 5.4%. Um, is that fixed for the lifetime? If we borrowed it tomorrow, we would fix at that price for 25 years, or that could go up or go down? Is there a cap and a collar on it? Or Well, a week before I got these figures, it was 4.5%. It's 5.4% last week. I haven't actually checked today, but hopefully it'll be stable for a couple of weeks. So if we get the application in. Oh, yes. It's only fixed for the 25 years. So if yes. if it goes up, we're protected. But if it goes down, we, we, we still have to pay it. Yes. Um, understand that. Uh, so what we're doing is refitting the building that we've got at the moment. People have seen the pictures of it. The, the, the um, doors are coming around to the front to overlook the uh, Mary Bailey playing field rather than around the back where they're prone to vandalism, as we've experienced this week. And thanks to Paul for getting on with fixing a fire in the roof or putting a board across it or whatever you have to do. Um, so I'm glad there's a contingency in there as well, because as always with our plans, when we open it up, we'll find some horrible nasties in there, which we don't know about. So I'm glad that we've covered that as well. So, um, I don't really have much more to say about it, but thanks for getting on with it. You, um, Sarah, Jane and others who've been involved in this over the last couple of years. So, uh, do you want me to propose? No, no, no. I need to have something to ask first. And then you can propose by all means. Yeah, thank you, Viv. Um, yeah, we've known about this for quite a while. Just one point of clarity, if I may. Um, we, uh, if, if I remember rightly, we had an earmarked reserve of about £56,000, was it? Something like that, originally put aside for, um, for the toilets. Are we saying we need this loan on top of that? Or are we saying we are still going to earmark and keep those, that money in reserve and just use the full amount for this? So we now have £56,000 we were planning to spend on the toilets, which we can now use for other things within the work programme. Is that right? That's correct. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Nice short and sweet question and answer. Um, Mark, would you like to propose the recommendation? Can I have someone to second, please? Anita? Oh, oh sorry, I didn't see hands. Carla, Lisa. Um, just uh, looking looking at the figures, um, and um, English was my strength, not, not math. So if somebody could check this, that'd be great. Um, looking at repayments of 11 grand over 25 years, that's two hundred and seventy-seven thousand pounds. Am I right? Yep. Which means that repayment is one hundred and twenty-seven thousand pounds over twenty-five years. Yep. So we're paying one hundred and twenty-seven thousand pounds to borrow one hundred and fifty-two thousand pounds. 
Yes, yeah. I think is the answer to that. By the time you get to the 25th year, inflation will have caught up and the 11,000 pounds will be worth tuppence. Yes. So actually it doesn't really matter. It's the same as your old it's, it's, yeah, that's... Yeah. Okay. okay, any other? <laughs> I, I did say, I, I one, one more, can we keep it quick? Where other options of financing this looked at in that case? We, we were looking to have some buckets at, in marketplace, but we thought <laughs> it might not be enough. Um, I mean, yes, we allocated a, a capital sum for this project about four or five years ago, um, but because it's taken so long to come through, uh, that capital sum uh, isn't enough. Uh, and at the time, we had no idea that the changing places toilet would cost this much either. Um, but also, given the circumstances we find ourselves in at the moment with the cost of living crisis, actually holding back a little bit of capital money for other causes, we thought was, well, that's what we're proposing to, to sort of to, to be quite a good idea at the moment. Do we have any information about how much the cafe will bring in? Uh, we haven't sorted out the legal arrangement with the cafe, but it is a community offering. So we're not intending to um, charge a great deal of rent on it because of the service they'll be providing. Tracy. Have we built into the, uh, have we any data or information about how much this new form of design and build will um, alleviate repetitive vandalism? And have we built anything into fixing um, continued vandalism of our beautiful and expensive new lavatories so it, it is it is hoped that the new design will reduce vandalism because there won't be these communal spaces to congregate in so it could be similar to the one down at the, you know, the cattle market those the unisex toilets and also most of the equipment is set within the walls so it's less easy to break off because that tends to be what the the cleaners are reporting is people are breaking things off and uh, and that's considered best practice and uh, yeah, so the people who have people who have submitted their tenders have come and seen it and that's they specialize in public toilet design yeah okay we all questioned thank you mark would you like to propose and anita seconded and all those in favor of accepting the recommendation Woo -hoo! we have lou yeah, I think that's um, not quite unanimous. Yeah, they're, they're majority, uh, let's take it. I'm, I'm just upset because I, I don't feel I fully understand. Uh, I'm not particularly. Okay. <laughs> so, two abstentions. Yes, if someone can go and just give him a nudge and say he's welcome back. Thank you, Viv. And thanks for the work. Okay, uh, next item is a quick update on the football club from, I said, <laughs> from Councillor Mel Usher. Thank you, Mel. Uh, Nick just told me, be brief, whatever you are. Okay. Um, so the progress of the club, I will be brief. For those of you who couldn't attend on Monday night, it was, uh, it was a real eye-opener. Uh, over 125 people turned out at the clubhouse. We had four speakers from various quarters, one from the club, one from the council, one from the Football Supporters Association, and, and two from Bath City who've gone through this kind of experience previously. The room was then split into tables with a facilitator on each table and asked to look at a series of questions and Lisa ran that exercise and energized the room uh, right across the board, which was great. The results have now been taken away and have been analyzed, ready for a, what would be a public and a transparent report. 22 of the uh, 125 people put their name down to actually go on potential steering groups uh, next and, and gave us some of their experiences. And we'll be looking into that over the next week. On a show of hands the across the room, they were virtually unanimous that we go forward down this route of, uh, of a community owned football club using a community benefit society probably as the vehicle. Uh, there was one table, slightly awkward table, that, um, that didn't that neither vote for or against. 
Um, so I'm not quite sure where they were coming from, although I am, but I'm not going to mention it. Uh, now the hard work really starts, uh, and, and, it's, and I'm, I really am confident that because the Football Supporters Association, which is a nat national body, have done this almost 40 times previously, uh, that they'll be able to, to chaperone uh, us through the, this, this period. Uh, and they have a, a suite of, uh, of forms and concepts and ideas that they'll give to us for free uh, during uh, this time. Uh, just a big thanks to um, to all the, the staff and councillors who turned out. There was a lot of them. Uh, and it was a really professional meeting as a result of that, because we were trying to avoid just a shouting match between people who've been shouting at each other for the last 25 years. Uh, and that was great on the night. And also to Nick White, and I'm hoping that we can write to him formally because he chaired that meeting. And he was really good, even though I was quite nervous about him, because uh, uh, he, he can go off on one quite easily. Uh, but he was fantastic and he was really good. I'm going to ask you just for a little... Uh, just to, just to go with me, uh, I've checked this with uh, with Peter and with Paul. We're now getting into a stage where we've got to move fairly quickly. If you remember, you agreed that uh, we would pay off the debt. We would take the first charge on the on the, on the buildings on the ground, and we've done that. Uh, and that we would have an option to buy the club for a pound uh, sometime in the next ten months. I would just want you to perhaps. Just agree again that um, when the time and the conditions are right, um, that delegated authority be given to the town clerk, the deputy town clerk, and to councillors Collier and Usher uh, to expedite that option um, for the purpose of buying the club for one pound. I say that because there's going to be a series of very tight decisions that have got to be made. Um, it's no secret that we, we need to sort out the organisation, we need to sort out through town holdings, we need them to go out of uh, existence, but we also need to make sure that they stay in existence long enough for us to give them the pound on the day we decide. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't be able to have anybody to buy the club off. Uh, so we just there just might be a point sometime in the next few weeks when we've just got to say, OK, this is it, this, we're going to do it. Um, so, a show of hands? yeah, I mean, can if we just have a show, a show of hands on that, that would be really so, uh, uh, Hang on, yeah. questions, questions, Fiona, then Tracy. My very, uh, I'm trying to rack my memories to my understanding of it, was that the, the argument about when we buy the land, we then take on responsibility and legal responsibility for the grounds. Is that true? And do you, you I trust your judgment, do you just, have any concerns about just for just Just to make it a short exercise, as Nick asked, uh, we are also preparing a lease to give to the football club, not to Froome Town Holdings, and they will be responsible for all repairs, maintenance, health and safety okay. at that point. So we so, sort of hand over, we get responsibility, yeah. then hand it very quickly. That's right. So, uh, so we've got to get that license sometime in the next week as well, which our solicitors are working on as we speak. That's highly unlikely because they're not that good. Uh, <laughs> oh, did you okay, have sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Is Tracy? Yeah, can can I can I, I go on. The, the 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 proposed delegation needs to be to me and the RFO, not, oh, okay, not the right deputy right. town clerk. Okay, that's Thank fine. You. Tracy, um, the named um, delegation, which was um, you and Councillor Collier as well. Yeah. Um, is there something in place formally if um, one person were not to be available or incapacitated or? Ha well, what happens if we're on this kind of time level on it and somebody's not available? How are you feeling, Anita? Uh, <laughs> We're all right I'm tonight. Okay. Apparently it's uh, Paul. You don't really need that, to be honest. I, the first okay, time I wrote it, I just said, fine. I just put my own name down, but it's better to have the leader. And actually, the delegation is really Paul. Okay. It just, you know, sounded like it was very, very specific. Y yeah. Well, I, I just needed to name two councils. Could have been you. Any other questions before we, Nick? <laughs> Difficult one, Mel. Um, I'm a bit out of touch with this because I've been away for a while, but we're not losing sight of the opportunity to get involved with um, affordable housing on this scheme, are we? Uh, no. Okay. Nice. We've actually prepared a planning brief. Whether Anita. Or not we can implement it is another matter, but yeah. Anita. Oh, sorry, just tiny. I'm just wondering if, because I've been named in this summer along the way, <laughs> <laughs> am I allowed to vote? Oh. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Okay. Any other quick questions before we show of hands, Paul? We'll just read it out one more time for the 
for the record. Can you read out the recommendation? Uh, can you see my writing? Mm -hmm. um, as well. <laughs> when the time and conditions are right, the delegate authority be given to the town clerk and the finance director, RFO, uh, in consultation with councillors Usher, Usher and Collier to expedite the option to purchase the stadium and club for one pound. Show of hands, cards. And Mel. 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 I'll, I did. And me. Um, that's unanimous. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And thanks, Mel, for all your work on this and Lisa for the event and everyone who was involved on Monday night. It really was very well done. Uh, okay. Point seven. Uh, Laura, update on levers and starters. Oh, you'll be pleased to say I have nothing to add. It's all in the report. Any questions? <laughs> Fiona. Uh, I was, I'm not in any way disputing, by the way, the, uh, that they have been hired. Um, the two um, people we've hired on the refugee coordinator roles. Um, but where is the funding for that coming from? And could that be made clearer when we are told about people Kate. being hired, if that's OK? Kate. So the funding for the roles has come from the government to Somerset County Council to an organisation called CARES, <coughs> voluntary organisation to us. So they are 100% funded and uh, we've also put in the budget um, some additional resource, so capacity really to support and manage them. It's for a year. Uh, if it were to be continued after that, the funding would need to come from a similar source. Um, so will they be on a year contract? That's right, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Um, any other questions on... Staff, Phil. On, on that point of Ukraine refugees, um, if we're taking over the administration of that in these posts, um, is there any liability for when the six month period of host families taking um, Ukrainian refugees comes to an end and they effectively become homeless? Uh, the posts are to support refugees and their hosts, uh, but primarily to support refugees. We're obviously working with Free and Welcome to Refugees and the next, who, who are currently working to bring forward the next round of hosts, if you like. So, um, but no, there's, we have no liability. We're not responsible for refugees. There are refugee resettlement officers at the County Council who have a responsibility. Thank you, Kate. Any other questions before we move to the last item? Okay, um, this I think I'm handing over to Andy Jones here. Yeah. This is an item to approve of updates to three chapters in the Constitution relating to civic protocol complaints procedures and RFO, which is Responsible Finance Officer Protocol. Uh, yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, I, I mean, I think the team's done a great job in reviewing those for us the most of the wording was fine but there were just a couple of suggestions that i wanted uh, to put in as proposed amendments to what was written um so particularly uh, regarding the mayor's allowance just clarifying that it's uh, it's established as part of the annual budget making process uh, and the second recommendation uh, to, uh chapter 10 was already marked as being reviewed in three years and to me that seems a sensible time frame to be reviewing the other chapters as well um, not a lot changes but we need to keep them as live and active as uh, as we can so that's my proposal if anybody's happy to second it is everyone clear on what that means can is there anything else you can explain to those who are okay so the the, the review schedule says that actually each chapter should be looked at in a particular period of time. And when we review it this time, we state what time it's going to be reviewed in next time. And we're just saying, let's make that three years for everything. Clearer? Sense. Better? Happier? Okay, so Andy, I presume... So, so we need to 
Andy's proposing, proposing. amendments and then we vote on the amended chapters. So Andy, so somebody needs to second Andy's proposal, Anne, and then we need to agree that. Show of cards. That's majority. Are you abstaining then? Okay. And then we need to vote on the amended amendments. <laughs> Can I have a proposal for that? Fiona and a seconder, Philip, and all those in favour, red cards. Okay. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Any other closing observations or thoughts or questions? Thank you very much then to everyone who came and all those viewing at home and to all our presenters. See you at the next Froome Town Council meeting here on the 16th of November. <laughs>